While researching his book, Stinnett uncovered a second document drafted by Leekweiler and received by his superiors in Washington. In it, Stinnett says Leekweiler indicates that his Corregidor team is reading current traffic and has broken the Japanese naval code. Commander Leekweiler says that he was current in, in uh, de intercepting, decoding, and translating the messages as of November 16th, 1941. What more do you need? Stinnett also maintains that the enormous Japanese fleet, led by Vice Admiral Nagumo, broke radio silence as they pushed toward Pearl Harbor, allowing U.S. interceptors to track the course of the attacking fleet. The actual evidence that Stinnett has uncovered that not only did Nagumo break radio silence, but the U.S. Uh, naval listening posts were listening to Nagumo's transmissions and therefore plotting Nagumo's voyage across the Pacific towards Pearl Harbor only adds credence to the explanation that FDR suppressed here yet another piece of vital intelligence, deliberately kept the commanders at Pearl Harbor in the dark. Late November 1941, Japanese warships churn toward Hawaii. As they do, some believe that President Franklin D. Roosevelt is setting up Pearl Harbor for disaster. Author Robert Stinnett has proof, he says, that the Japanese fleet broke radio silence during their trek southeastward. If so, the U.S. Navy would have been well aware of the Japanese approach. The radio silence uh, doctrine is another of the major Pearl Harbor hoax. It, 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 it holds that, uh, that beginning on, on November 25th Hawaii time, the Japanese Navy went on radio silence. To date, most historians have accepted that the Japanese maintained strict radio silence as they neared Hawaii. Stinnett agrees that the Japanese Navy ordered radio silence, but, he says, a proviso in the order allowed individual Japanese commanders to ignore it. The Japanese admirals, for some strange reason, they threw that order to the wind and engaged in extensive radio communications with one another as they were approaching Pearl Harbor. One American tracking those communications, Stinnett says, was Leslie Groken, a radio operator on a cruise ship bound for Honolulu. The SS Lurleen, which is a passenger liner, was en route from San Francisco to Hawaii. They also had a radio direction finder aboard, and the radio operators were listening to the Japanese warships. So they picked up the messages, these extensive uh, uh, military naval communications. And they picked him up from about November 30th uh, to about December the 5th. Days after the Pearl Harbor attack, U.S. Naval Intelligence confiscated the original log from the Lurleen, including Grogan's notes. The log was eventually stored away in a federal record center outside San Francisco. It then somehow disappeared. All that now remains is an undated, unsigned withdrawal slip. But Grogan apparently reconstructed his notes the same day his log was taken. Fifty years later, Robert Stinnett hunted them down. Grogan writes that the Japanese radio transmission boldly blasts away. The signals were good enough to get good DF, radio direction finder bearings. And the main body of the signals came from north and west of Honolulu. Stinnett maintains that even U.S. naval intelligence in Pearl Harbor picked up the radio transmissions of the Japanese fleet. He points to a communications intelligence summary from the Navy's listening post at Pearl. The document was written November 25, 1941, the same day the Japanese attack fleet left for Hawaii. It reports that the commander-in-chief of Japan's first air fleet, Vice Admiral Nagumo, held extensive communications with his Central Pacific commander. Stinnett asserts that the ominous radio traffic was picked up by Allied personnel 
throughout the Pacific Rim. You have the stations at Seattle, you have the stations in Eureka and San Francisco picking up the same, same messages. This is not one or two, this is uh, uh, scores of people reporting, uh, hearing these messages, and it was put in, in, in the naval records, it's documented. In fact, a meeting does take place at the White House after, Stanet says, stations on the West Coast intercepted a flurry of Japanese communications. In attendance, President Roosevelt, the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Harold Stark, and Army Chief of Staff, General George Marshall. On November 27th, uh, uh, President Roosevelt told uh, General Marshall to send a message to the Hawaiian and Philippine commanders don't interfere with Japan's overt act of war. The United States desires that they, uh, Japan, commit the first overt act. The Navy commander at Pearl Harbor, Admiral Husband Kimmel, receives this message at his headquarters. In other words, let the Japanese submarines uh, uh, enter Pearl Harbor and try to sink our ships. There's no argument about what FDR meant. Uh, he meant that, um, that the U.S. naval plan uh, to defend Pearl Harbor should not and cannot be executed. Admiral Stark and FDR, it seems, obviously, wanted the Japanese to surprise and utterly destroy Pearl Harbor. <laughs> At 7.55 a.m. on December 7th, after a 3,500-mile rush across the North Pacific, a huge Japanese flotilla of nearly three dozen ships delivers its deadly cargo of bombers and fighter planes. Within two hours, one of the first entirely carrier-based air assaults in military history obliterates the U.S. base at Pearl Harbor. sneak attack demolishes most of the U.S. Pacific Fleet and kills more than 2,400 sailors, soldiers, and civilians. The next day, the United States declares war on Japan. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Three days later, Germany, Japan's ally, declares war on the U.S. According to Hill and Stanett, these events unfold exactly as Roosevelt had intended. The historical record says that Pearl Harbor was a tragic consequence of bungled opportunities and missed clues. But Stanett, Hill, and others believe that is a naive interpretation of events. If anything, they say, President Roosevelt was directly responsible for the tragedy of Pearl Harbor. Gross negligence becomes high treason when the motive is discovered or understood 